What's going on, my little neckbeards? Welcome back to more Hair Schnitzel Nazi. This time, part three, Fire and Blood. So this fantastic story of Fire and Blood was a session right after our last adventure, which saves us most of a recap. However, something did take place outside of the game. We play the game every Sunday. We have a group chat where we can coordinate, talk, and share the occasional meme with one another. In this group chat, probably around Thursday or something, I posted that I didn't think the GM was capable of killing off Herr Schnitzel Nazi. What are you gonna do? Stab me? Man, he was stabbed. I'm taking that as a challenge, was all he said in response. After that, I knew that I'd done fucked up. So I had to mentally prepare myself for the session, because the GM's words and some sort of sixth sense told me that if I wasn't careful, Herr Schnitzel Nazi would die this session. My Nazi senses were tingling, if you would. The session began with us back in the summer camp. The girl who played Mackenzie decided to take one of the other campers as a character. This one was a girl named Susie who was unusually good with the rifle and was basically our assassin. The president, Gobbledick's old player, decided that he was going to be a hobo named Hobo Joe that we found in Through the Woods. Joe was a rather interesting character who was predominantly a melee character and armed with a fire axe, two combat knives, knives? Two combat knives and was quite good at making and throwing Molotov cocktails. Anyways, back to the story, our gang of misfits started looking through some of the old books and writings that we stole and couldn't make heads or tails of anything, because none of us had any skill with the occult. So, we decided to head into a fairly large town that was only a few miles away. Before we drove there, Buddy discovered that one of the other camp counselors was in fact an imposter. After a brief session of interrogation, we discovered that the guy was a member of the cult and had been spying on us for a while. He laughed in our faces when he said that he already sent word to the cult and that they'd never stop hunting us. Coney then decided that he wanted to give the children a fun activity. So we ordered them all to get knives, forks, stakes, sharpened sticks, or anything like that and had them gather in the main gathering section. We then tossed them the cultists, bound and gagged, and told the children to have fun. According to the GM, after a week of being told violence and murder is okay and receiving Coney's valuable training, the children swarmed the cultists like a band of angry sharks. Coney was so proud of the kids that the merciless slaughter brought a tear to his eye. We need that picture of Mushu going, my little baby, off to destroy people? That'd be uh, very fitting this particular occasion, I think. So after scarring over a hundred children, scarring, I prefer the term hardening, but that's just me. So after hardening over a hundred children to the illustrious allure of bloodlust and battle, we decided to leave to go to the town where Hobo Joe knew of a professor of the occult lived. At this point, we still had my Pinto cruising wagon and Chuck's van. Remember that. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is brought to you by the Furry Hunter class! <laughs> it's a class dedicated to slaying the furry menace that infests the land of Neckbeardia. And yeah, if you haven't noticed, it's a party of Matt Mercer of Critical Role's Blood Hunter. It's a solid shitpost put together by us and a few of the DMs in the West March server. It's a great way to help us, and for the low low price of just one pound, it's hard to go wrong with the PDF. But enough of the Blood Hunter, let's get back to the video. We arrived in the town and immediately got to work trying to find the professor, who Hobo Joe had met in a Costco. As you could imagine, this wasn't easy, particularly when one of the people asking was dressed like an African warlord and another in full SS attire. Eventually, we got a lead where a local bar owner said the professor frequents it every night with his wife. That's when we decided to stake it out. Unfortunately for us, we didn't see the professor until the cultist arrived. We didn't notice them at first. They weren't dressed in the white jumpsuits like earlier. They wore normal civilian clothes. 
We watched them from our cars as they pulled a dazed elderly couple out of a bar, each with what appeared to be head wounds. We ran out of our cars to try and help them, but before we could, two of the men pulled out assault rifles and fired on us. I and Senator Fister took a couple of shots, but overall we were alright. Our party was pretty heavily fucking armed after all. We took the professor and his wife and set them in our cars. After all the stuff we've seen, we all agreed that driving back to the camp alone at night was way too risky, so we rented out hotel rooms a few blocks down. It was a rather stressful experience, even inside of the hotel. We kept looking out of the windows and noticing the same few cars constantly driving by, and a group of people were staring at us all night. Didn't exactly need to jump to too many conclusions to assume that the cultists had surrounded us. We gave the professor and his wife some over-the-counter painkillers to help them concentrate, and eventually they came out of their dazed state. When the professor woke us up and saw that we were most certainly not his would-be captors, he was so thankful that he was willing to help us in any way possible. We showed him the texts and drawings from the book that we stole, and he said that he recognized them in some of the artistry and stories from some of the local Native Americans. Additionally, he could roughly translate some of our texts. He said that they were prophecies in historic, historic, esoteric ramblings. Gotta hate being a fucking redneck sometimes. <sighs> he said that they were prophecies and esoteric ramblings about something only referred to as the God in the Lake and about how he requires servants. So after telling the professor about the cult to this god in the lake and how they'll do anything in their power to kill him because he's the only one within the hundreds of miles who could help us stop them, he seemed to go into a rather worried state. Clearly the lazy shit has never had people try to kill him before. We spent the entire night on watch for the cultist. We figured that even they wouldn't dare risk exposure unless they absolutely had to, and we were completely right. It was around 8 a.m. before anyone else got up when I was watching the cultist. I decided to act in the schnitzel Nazi way because we needed a way through. I headed down to the parking garage where my car was and got out every stick grenade I could carry, as well as another Panzer Shrek and four rockets. I also took out extra Luger and Sturmgewehr 44 ammo with me, because I figured that after last time, the GM would want that car and all of its goodies destroyed, and I needed to stock up. The parking garage had two exits to it, and thanks to my recon, I noticed that the cultists were patrolling both of them. Just as damned good soldiers of the Third Reich would, Herr Schnitzel Nazi said aloud. I went to the north exit, which was larger and had a few more cultists guarding it. Figured that if I was going to do this, I'd do it where the most cultists were. Four rockets later, I had successfully obliterated their cars, all but one of their members, and severely damaged the road, making it nigh useless. I put the weapon back in the car, and immediately ran to my hotel room, where staff and guests were clearly freaking the fuck out about the four missiles that just went off outside, exactly as planned. Evil, <laughs> schnitzel Nazi hands rubbed together excitedly. I threw open the door to our room and yelled at everyone to get going immediately, because the cultist cars just suddenly exploded for some reason. We all reached our cars, and I specifically told Buddy, the driver of Chuck's old truck, that he was to follow me no matter what I did. When I got into the car, I gave one of my Panzerfaust to Susie, who was riding shotgun. I told her that if there's anything blocking our way, she was to shoot it. Gave her the Panzerfaust because the young thing couldn't handle the full Panzer Shrek, and damn if I didn't have the little psychopath's best interest at heart. I had correctly assumed that the police, EMTs, fire trucks, and debris clearing department, whatever they're called, would have blocked off the road so that they could clear it, which meant that the cultists assumed that our only way out was the south exit, meaning they were waiting for us to come out there and not the north, because clearly no one would be crazy enough to go out of the north lot now. My evil plan had succeeded. Somehow, both Buddy and I passed our driving checks to get past a really fucked up road, burning wrecks of cars and police vehicles. 
Susie really only had to fire the Panzerfaust once. We made it, we thought. Unfortunately for us, the GM wasn't going to have us win that easily. One of the cultists had seen us leaving from across the street and immediately set out in pursuit. One fired an RPG and hit Chuck's truck behind us, which immediately did a flip and crashed. Now, the professor and his wife were in that car, so we figured we couldn't leave them. Who also cares about allies anyway? I stopped my Pinto cruising wagon and I, Coney, Hobo Joe, and Susie got out guns blazing and ready. We examined the other car and found that the professor, his wife, and Senator Fister had all miraculously survived. I'll bet at really low HP. Unfortunately, Buddy had died on impact. I stealthily swiped the massive bag of weed he kept on himself because I'd be damned if I let those cultists enjoy it. The cultists all pulled up their cars around us and got out, guns drawn, ready to kill. One of their priests approached us and offered us mercy if we surrendered then and there because he admired our tenacity. Simultaneously seeing where that was going and having my Nazi senses tingling, I immediately... <laughs> You could play a fucking drinking game with these stories, but how many times this guy types out immediately? I immediately pulled out the pins on two of my grenades and yelled back, Screw you, nerds! And throwing it at them with an excellent roll to boot. The survivors all crammed themselves into my car and we drove off. I personally think that it was thanks to my obscenely high luck score, but we somehow avoided all bullet fire. We drove down to the downtown area, desperate to lose them, and eventually we heard what sounded like the same inhuman screaming coming from the forest around the town that we heard when the brethren attacked us, as well as the sounds of something bigger. We looked around us and found that brethren and cultists were all attacking the populace, driving off civilians and of course just killing them, leading to civil panic. We also noticed that an absolutely massive eldritch horror had come into the town and was in hot pursuit of us. Ignoring traffic and telling Coney and Susie to shoot everything they had at it, we were only just managing to stay away from it, but clearly wanted us to die way too much. I think it was at that moment when one of the cultist priests put a curse on my car, which caused me to immediately lose control and ram right into a bar. Immediately. I'm getting a shot, fuck it. <sniffs> Unfortunately, Susie died on impact because she wasn't wearing her booster seat, I guess. Apparently, you're supposed to make children wear seat belts. <laughs> Who'd have guessed? The professor's wife also hadn't taken the impact well and was currently in the process of dying. While I let Coney, Fister, and Hobo Joe deal with all that, I immediately... Up, oh, up, oh, you said immediately again. Time to... Hold on. <sniffs> Ugh. I immediately ran into the bar and proceeded to smash every bottle I could and start setting the place on fire. The giant monster was right outside, along with about half a dozen fucking brethren who were in the process of rushing us, and a group of cultists was standing outside, assault rifles in hand. One of the brethren attacked me, but thanks to a good dexterity roll, I was able to sort of roll it over me and ride into a pile of broken glass and fire. Speaking of which, apparently bars burned down really well, because the place was a fucking inferno by the time we were about halfway done in dealing with the brethren. By then, though, Senator Fister had passed out due to the sheer panic of the situation, failed Sandy Roll, and fell into some flames. Unfortunate, but one shouldn't cry over an incinerated senator. What the fire did do was give the big bad monster a deterrent from reaching into the place to devour and or crush us to death. Damned convenient, I thought. So, because he couldn't do this, the GM decided to kill another bird, so to speak. The GM pretty much wanted my car dead from the very first time I fired a Panzer Shrek. So he had the monster lean down and take a massive bite out of its back in order to begin the process of swallowing it whole. But the GM had forgotten something. I may have mentioned this earlier, but the reason why Pinto cruising wagons were so unpopular was not just because of the fact that they're absolutely hideous looking. 
I discovered rather recently that it was also because they had a tendency to explode rather violently if a large amount of force were directed towards the rear of the car, such as if it were rear-ended, or if some, oh I don't know, giant monster were to take an enormous bite out of it. And because my car was already filled to the brim with grenades, rockets, and other such things, the explosion would have been enough to level half of a city block if it were on the ground when it blew up, as opposed to right by what I assume was the monster's face. The look on GM's face was priceless when he found this out, but he couldn't do anything about it, and due to the absolutely massive amount of damage dealt to the giant monster, it died immediately, immediately, time for a shot. <coughs> Fuck. This event caused so much shock and awe in the cultists that it gave me the perfect opportunity to instead take charge of things going on here. Coney and I shot dead three or four of the cultists across the street. Hobo Joe restrained them. Those fuckers took my Pinto cruising wagon, the thing filled with what the Fuhrer himself had directly asked Herr Schnitzel Nazi to keep safe. Just to clarify that I am once again role playing here. The GM didn't even make me roll for an intimidate check, which was good because my score was abysmal there. Apparently I am so full of rage that the cultist couldn't help but tell me what I want to know. I demanded to know where that fucking priest was who made me lose control of my goddamned car was. The others in the party immediately up up for another shot. No. <coughs> oh my god. It's 10:30 in the morning. What am I doing this? The others in the party immediately <coughs> immediately didn't know what I was doing, but I'd be damned if I was going to let that bastard get away with it. Escape didn't matter to me anymore. This was personal. The cultist didn't know, but he did have the phone number of the priest. After thanking him and ordering Hobo Joe to murder him in whatever way seemed fit to a deranged hobo, I took the phone and impersonated the cultist. I bluffed that the enemies, us, were trying to hunt him down so that he couldn't put any more curses on their cars as they tried to escape. He then told me that he was hiding out in a certain gas station within the city, and he ordered us to retreat to defend him and gave us his location. 4D Nazi chess intensifies. I told Coney and the others that this was our only hope of killing the cultist priest, and with him dead we might be able to put a huge damper on whatever the fuckers were planning. I told them that they should attack the guy from the front while I went in from the rear. They went along with it and I stole some guy's bike from a bike rack and went off. In truth, I was lying to them as well. I wasn't going to attack from the rear. No, that fucker is responsible for my car's fiery and glorious destruction. He doesn't deserve to simply be gunned down. I had to kill him with fire and blood. I started sending private messages to the GM telling him my plan in secret, and at this point I think he actually wanted me to do this. So as Coney, Hobo Joe, and the Professor, who was in a murderous state at the loss of his wife at this point, played out their attack on the gas station, I rode the bike over to an airfield that I saw on our way into town. I went over and found the largest helicopter that I could, judo kicking the pilot who was trying to flee at this point away from it. After, after hot wiring it, I started to fly it to where the, my GPS told me the gas station was. Fortunately, I actually had pilot as a skill. I will never forget the looks on everyone's face when the GM said, Through the hail of gunfire and violence, you hear the unmistakable sound of a large helicopter approaching. As you look up, you notice that it appears to be heading for a direct impact for the gas station. As realization suddenly dawned on players and the cultists alike, I jumped from the helicopter after with my parachute, after securing the shaft so that it could not avoid hitting the gas station directly. Thing about gas stations is that when they explode, they explode big. Everyone around it was probably vaporized if I had to guess. Now I personally thought that I needed to distract the cultists, otherwise they might have seen the helicopter coming too early and escaped. But I also honestly thought that the others wouldn't have been so close and would have been outside of the radius of the explosives. 
Or that is that maybe I forgot to tell them? I was also surprised when none of them were really mad at me, even though I killed all of them and the professor. I guess they thought it was a hilarious way to go. So the game ended as I stood at the top of the building surveying the wreckage. Though fire and blood was wrought, I was the lone survivor of the party. Was it worth it? Fuck yeah it was. Oh.